So what's this man doing in a super show of lowriders in Las Vegas, Nevada in 2009? Okay, just hold that thought. And you're probably asking, what the hell is a lowrider? Well, I'll get to that in a minute, too. Okay? This starts uh, long ago. First of all, before I start, I would like to thank Malcolm for that, that introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm very moved by the introduction. And uh, you do me uh, the honor. Thank you. That, grave, that open grave was not meant for new faculty members. <laughs> but I think it scared him. Um, so yes, I've known Malcolm for that long, and then had the pleasure when I was dean of, of uh, asking Malcolm to become the head of Spanish and Portuguese, and that department has taken off um, over, the, over the time that Malcolm has served as, as, its, as its head. And I'm very proud when I stepped down as dean of the College of Humanities in 2008 to go back as a uh, faculty member in that department. And I'd like to thank my young colleagues who are here today, um, it's, and, and some of my graduate students as well. Thank you so much for coming. OK, so I'm nine years old in Mexico. My older brother, who's, uh, no, I'm not even that. I'm uh, uh, six. My older brother, who's been uh, subscribing to American comic books, Captain Marvel, Superman, Batman, you know, all those uh, comic books uh, that if you'd saved them would be worth a fortune. He goes off to school, to boarding school, um, and he says, he boxes up his comic books and he says, don't you touch these comic books. If you do, they'll be hell to pay, or whatever the equivalent was. So he went off to, to high school, and the first day he was gone, I took a crowbar, um, and I, I went into the basement, and I wedged part of the, the box, just enough so I could slip out a comic. Well, I did that over the course of the next three months, and when he came home for Christmas vacation, they were all gone. So he was not pleased, and I don't think he's forgotten it to this day, but I did pay for it. And you would think that something like that would have traumatized um, a young boy to where he would never want to look at a comic book again in his life. Okay, fast forward to 1974. Um, I'm teaching at the University of Minnesota Morris, and we've established a program in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And uh, about halfway through the summer session, uh, it occurs to... Uh, my friend and colleague Harold Hines Jr., an historian, and myself, that were really missing the boat. Now, he was a trained Latin American uh, historian. I was trained in Latin American literature. I was trained uh, and wrote my dissertation on a Chilean novelist, Jose Donoso. But he, he, uh, we get together and we say, you know, we're missing the boat here. We really should be using comic books in the classroom. The comic books that are out on the street uh, that come out every week and that are circulated multiple times in the rental market on the street are really a window onto Mexican culture. So over the, the course of the next few years uh, on subsequent trips back to Cuernavaca, uh, we go into Mexico City on the weekends and we go to the, the darkest, dustiest used uh, magazine and, and bookstores that incidentally, if you know Mexico City, were all clustered around the famous or infamous prison of Le Cumberi that uh, 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 was uh, feared by many. Anyway, we uh, collected runs of Mexican comic books. Uh, we, our careers took other paths. I left uh, the University of Minnesota, and it wasn't until 1992 that we published a book on Mexican comic books called not just for children, the Mexican comic book in the 1960s and 1970s. And we, a we analyzed 10 uh, different titles. We collected enough of, of each to have a decent run. And uh, we uh, did a content analysis of contemporary Mexican issues, social, historical, cultural issues using the comic books as our 
as our vehicle. And then it was uh, translated and published in Mexico uh, several years uh, later. And uh, unlike the American edition, they actually put some money into uh, colored plates. So about that time, uh, my colleague Alex uh, just gave a wonderful, wonderful talk on wonder. Well, maybe this was our epiphanous moment, or one of our epiphan epiphanous moments, Alex. So we looked at each other and we said, why don't we start a journal? And we'll call it Studies in Latin American Popular Culture. So we had our first conference in 1981 in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I was teaching at the time, New Mexico State University, and we started an annual publication. Studies in Latin American popular culture has, uh, has lasted all these many years. We stepped down as the editors uh, about uh, 12 years ago, and it's currently being edited by uh, my, my colleague, Melissa Fitch, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And it was just uh, three years ago accepted by the University of Texas Press as one of their journals, which is a dream come true because I went to the University of Texas uh, in that first year and tried to sell it to them and they wouldn't even show me, uh, they showed me the door. So it made full circle. We established uh, a reputation across the field and it's now housed in probably the press that is most appropriate uh, where it should be housed. So 19, uh, 2000, 2000, I think it is. Uh, the University of Arizona Press is starting a, Mex a, a, a new series called The Mexican American Experience. And I ask if I can do the, uh, uh, the book on Chicano culture, Mexican American culture, which is the middle book up here. And there's a little piece of, uh, of that book in one of the chapters on lowriders. And I based it mainly on very uh, scant to research at the time, and then the lowrider show in Tucson that was being held yearly at the convention center. And I guess uh, years later, uh, somebody from Greenwood Press must have been Googling lowriders, and my name came up. And uh, I was contacted by Greenwood Press, and they said, would you like, this is 208, would you like to do a book on lowriders? Now, I'd never owned a lowrider. I didn't know a great deal, really, about uh, the history of lowrider and lowrider culture, and I said, why not? Um, it's an interesting project. It's, it's something that's going to take me out of my, um, well, my, uh, my post-dean years. It was a great way to uh, transition to uh, back into research with something that I thought I could do a good job of. So two years hence, after attending several uh, super shows in Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas, and, and some minor ones. The book came out, and it's up here, uh, Low Riders. And uh, the topic of my uh, presentation today is the evolution of a cultural icon. And this has a serious side. So I'll get to what a low rider looks like right now. What is a low rider? What am I doing wrong? That one, thank you. The one closest to me. Okay. Let me get to, uh, I'll come back and go through these, but let me get to what a lowrider at a super show looks like today. Where's the one I want? Well, this will do. Okay, so I'll get, I'll get back to this. So what's a lowrider and what's been the evolution of the lowrider as a cultural icon? So since the mid-1940s, lowriders have played an important role as a dynamic, complex, and evolving po popular culture practice embedded in Mexican-American culture, which is itself embedded in a larger uh, dominant culture. This presentation is based on the consideration uh, set forth by scholars that popular culture is made by various formations of subordinated and disempowered people out of the resources, both discursive and material, that are provided by the social system that disempowers them. I'll focus initially on the creation of the lowrider phenomenon and then um, at, at the end of the Second World War as a popular cultural practice 
and then that arose spontaneously and then uh, trace its evolution uh, through uh, today, really, to the, the super shows. So the evolution of lowriders as a cultural icon against the general backdrop of rising tensions and social conflict during the 1960s and 1970s uh, between Los Angeles Anglo economic elites and the area's burgeoning and increasingly alienated and restive Mexican American population. Uh, that's the, the setting for its, uh, its development. But it begins earlier. So beginning in the 1940s, Los Angeles underwent a rapid transformation with the development of a huge housing const uh, construction uh, boom in the suburbs driven by the urgency to accommodate the burgeoning demand of housing by returning veterans. This led to a greater dependence on cars to transport these men and women and uh, from their homes to their jobs and this in turn led to the expansion of the freeway system across the Los Angeles area. The general prominence and importance of the car to a large percentage of Los Angeles population spurred a renewed interest and vigor among custom car and hot rod owners who now had available to them a bonanza of cheaper used cars, uh, ones that they could afford. The custom car craze that had temporarily come to a halt during the war years from 1941 to 1945 uh, continued after 1945 with the return of the veterans in a robust way energized by those who had discretionary income available to invest in modifying used automobiles. Thousands of Mexican American veterans who had either returned to the Los Angeles area or, or moved from all over the southwest in search of better paying jobs in the city's rapidly expanding industrial sector became car owners. In Los Angeles, Mexican-American uh, neighborhoods, custom car enthusiasts in the late 40s and early 1950s uh, began using small tires in order to lower their cruisers a few inches from the ground and to distinguish them from the other tendency that was prevalent um, in the Los Angeles area, that is uh, the, uh, the faster uh, cars built for, for speed. These were not built for speed. These were uh, built uh, with a different purpose. The lowering of a vehicle was also achieved at this time by cutting the suspension coils and by placing heavy objects such as cement bags or bricks in the trunk of the car. Mexican-American veterans with iron working or welding experience ex that they had gained through their military service were in great demand to put their skills to work to strip cars and rebuild them to different specifications. Although the term lowrider was still not commonly used in the early 1950s, much of the activity which was later associated with lowrider culture was common at the time. In East Los Angeles, groups of lowrider owners began in the early 1950s to organize themselves into clubs, just as were, there were clubs of, uh, of other car owners in, in the greater Los Angeles area. Club members would congregate and cruise down certain well-known Los Angeles streets, uh, such as Miracle Mile in West Los Angeles, Olvera Street, and especially Lincoln. It was not until the late 1950s that low and slow low riders or cruisers began to be systematically harassed by law enforcement officials, especially uh, the Los, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. This behavior was a continuation of decades of animosity between Mexican-American communities and the media, public, uh, not only the media, but public officials and law enforcement that had really peaked during World War II and manifested itself in episodes such as the 1943 Zoot Suit Riots. The pretext for stopping a low rider was that it was too low and causing damage by scraping the paved or cemented surface of the city streets. There was growing concern in the uh, larger community uh, and media coverage, coverage, particularly in the Los Angeles Times, that began to portray the lowrider clubs as gangs 
and, uh, and uh, causing a uh, public, uh, this caused a public outcry. Pressure on politicians resulted in the California legislature passing a law in 1959 prohibiting the use of any vehicle with any part of it below the rim base. Now remember, these were fixed low riders with cement uh, sacks and bricks and, and so forth in the back, so they couldn't be raised and lowered. This law led to the development of hydraulics, an ingenious device that low and slow cruiser enthusiasts began to instill in their cars. It was a very creative father and his son who went out to the local uh, uh, airplane uh, yard and took hydraulic systems off planes that had been, uh, like we have here in Tucson, that had been uh, put in storage. Uh, Lowrider owners could raise their cars a few inches whenever uh, they encountered a, a traffic policeman <laughs> and then proceed to lower it once they were clear. So it was this, this cat and mouse game. Go down the street if they would uh, uh, see, and this is the, uh, the, you know, there were no cell phones, there were no uh, CBs, et cetera, to communicate. It was just sight. And so they would raise their car and they would be legal again as they passed the, uh, the sheriff's car or the police car, and then they would lower them again. Cat and mouse. Talented mechanics set up their own hydraulic installing businesses that made this mechanical innovation less expensive and therefore uh, available to a greater number of lowrider owners. Uh, the, the widespread introduction of hydraulics can be seen as a strategy of resistance, in my view, that was used to undermine the established order, that was increasingly attempting to uh, uh, severely limit and stamp out the cultural practice popular in Los Angeles Mexican American neighborhoods, that is, lowriders. The 1960s can be viewed as a transitional decade for lowrider culture. Speed was not a characteristic of typical lowrider cars whose owners much preferred cruising very slowly down main streets so that the car's mechanical and decorative alterations could be fully viewed and appreciated. Lowrider clubs increasingly brought out their customized low and slow cars, thus the title, low and slow cars to cruise some of Los Angeles' busiest main streets like Tweedy Boulevard in Southgate, Van Nuys Boulevard in, in the San Fernando Valley, and Whittier Boulevard in East Los Angeles. One of the attractions, like, uh, attractions of streets like Whittier Boulevard was that the glass-fronted stores all along the cruising route reflected the drivers and the lowered seats as they carefully and proudly paraded their low-slung cars with their striking paint jobs and their distinctive features back and forth from one point to another. Uh, in the best urban cruising practice. By the mid-1960s, organized Mexican-American car clubs were cruising Whittier Boulevard. The clubs would typically park their cars in a designated parking area, such as a park or a drive-in restaurant, and display their vehicles in their club plaques, uh, their identity markers, for spectators to admire. As low, riders, as low riding became very well established in the Los Angeles area, in the 1960s, it was beginning to take root in other California cities, such as San Diego, San Francisco, and especially San Jose. It was also spread outside of California to cities like El Paso, Phoenix, San Antonio, Albuquerque, and the small New Mexico town of Española. Española, by the way, is, is, uh, is even today known as the lowrider capital of the United States. One of the factors that led to greater involvement of a few Los Angeles lowriders in political protest in the late 1960s was linked to the community-based activism organized by Mexican-American students at UCLA and at other Los Angeles universities. For example, the discovery by UCLA students of an economist 1967 report called Business and Mexican-American Relati Relations in East Los Angeles revealed that most of the businesses in East Los Angeles, including those along Whittier Boulevard, a favorite lowrider route, were owned by non-Mexican Americans who did not reside in that community. The report concluded that the presence of law enforcement along Whittier Boulevard and other uh, cruising routes could be attributed to pressure by outside business owners to protect their property. There had for several years been numerous instances of, the poli of police stopping, citing, and harassing lowriders for minor traffic infractions. 
There had also been some beatings by the police that had raised the ire of East Los Angeles residents. The combination of the heavy police presence, presence along Whittier Boulevard and the publication of the results of the report led to a mass protest demonstration on July 3rd, 1968 on Whittier Boulevard at which some low riders, student activists, and community members joined together to protest. Importantly, following the example of the students and community activists, many low rider, rival low rider clubs came together in solidarity to form an organization called the Federation of Low Riders to more effectively express their concerns about police harassment and to press their legitimate demands to have Whittier Boulevard reopened, invoking the constitutional guarantee of free assembly. The Federation took a leadership role in organizing community events and in sprucing up the streets and removing graffiti from the walls of businesses. The Federation also tried to create a dialogue with law enforcement officials, uh, but their efforts ultimately failed. skip some here so we can have some time for questions. So it went through its ups, the low rider uh, culture went through its ups and downs um, all through the 1970s and the 1980s, not only in Los Angeles, but in, in uh, uh, places like Phoenix, Albuquerque, El Paso, Houston, San Antonio, and of course here in Tucson as well. Now, hopping ahead a little bit, uh, low rider culture today has changed profoundly is manifested in the spaces where lowrider culture now th thrives, the super shows. So that's what we have here. So there's Chuck Tatum and his wife Ann, a much better photographer than Chuck, at the uh, 209 super show in Las Vegas, Nevada. So this is the outside. And you can see uh, some of the cars, but not the most decorated cars and not the most expensive cars, expensively decorated and mechanically sophisticated cars on the outside, on the grounds in the parking lot. And then uh, people come in, they're welcome to wander around the grounds of the show. Uh, you pay a modest price. Uh, you get to admire what's under the hood. You get to admire the fantastic uh, uh, paint jobs and, and the calls on these cars, uh, the hubcats, the whole thing. The, these are cars that uh, have been worked on for years. Some of them are owned by families and they're passed on from generation to generation. Um, or they're owned by the, uh, the lowrider clubs themselves. So these are, are considered mechanical marbles and also uh, you'll see a little bit later artistic uh, marbles as well in terms of, their, of their, uh, the amount of artistic talent and mechanical talent that's invested in them. I, I have these, uh, are some of the popular icons on the cars, for example, you have one here of Emiliano Zapata and uh, Pancho Villa who are icons of the Mexican Revolution and then uh, they're, they're decorated uh, pictures of uh, different uh, pictures of, of Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata are displayed in the windows as well as on the sides of the cars. Uh, you have religious icons as you see here and you have a whole family uh, that stand, stands proudly uh, by their car. This has a little bit of a softer look than some of the other cars. Just give you an appreciation of the intricacy of the, of the decoration, the decorative elements on the sides of the cars. And of course, uh, this, and th this is mild by comparison, believe me. I've, given, I've cleaned this up uh, a little bit. Um, the, some of the images displayed on the sides of cars as well as under hoods and, and under trunks are far more explicit than this one here. Here you have a, a uh, concession that's on the, on the inside of, of the display <coughs> building. And of course, what's associated with lowrider culture, what was associated with lowrider culture initially was the zoot suit. So you have here a, a father and son dressed up in zoot suit garb and of course selling zoot suits at their stand. And this is quite common uh, even today to have uh, lowriders uh, dressed as zoot suiters uh, attend uh, ceremonies, 
uh, celebrations, etc. But here you have an exaggeration of the so-called zoot suit, uh, zoot suit or stance, the uh, stance of defiance, uh, particularly the well on, the, on both the man and the, and the boy, kind of uh, showing us uh, you know the origins of this of this proud tradition. Merchandise, event merchandise, lowrider merchandise. Uh, these are just sort of random shots of things that you'll find um, outside of the uh, display buildings out in the parking lots. Uh, you can buy any paraphernalia you want, t-shirts, hats, zoot suits, uh, you name it. Here's one uh, stand devoted to hats. Now this is the inside, and unfortunately I don't have any pictures of the of the 1940s cars as they looked in 1940, but here you have a 1940 car, uh, highly treasured, uh, that was uh, um, uh, purchased by uh, the owner of this particular lowrider uh, probably 20, 25 years ago. And then over time, uh, he's adorned the car, brought it mechanically up to the level where he can display it uh, um, in, in a competitive uh, atmosphere, which is the, uh, the super show, uh, the large super shows. So you bring them in, and you don't drive these cars. These cars are not driven on the streets. They're too valuable. Uh, the only rule uh, that cars displayed on the inside of the uh, exhibit halls uh, has to conform to is that it has to be able to move 20 feet under its own power. <laughs> That's it. They're not to be driven. There are low riders that are driven on the streets, and if you want to see low riders, uh, go down to Tucson, meet yourself, and between the library and the, and the, and the park, uh, at every Tucson, meet yourself that I've attended, the Dukes uh, Car Club and other car clubs in, in uh, Tucson have displayed their cars, and they're only too, uh, uh, too glad to explain to you uh, the mechanics of the car, the paint, uh, the decals, et cetera. I gave a presentation for the Confluence Center on campus at, at the playground uh, downtown. It's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a bar next to the hub, and uh, through no uh, uh, part of my own, but somebody else arranged for the Dukes Car Club and another car club to bring their cars and park them in back of the, of the playground. And then the uh, lowriders and their families came in, and, and many of them are they're professionals. You have doctors, lawyers, uh, you name it, uh, financial planners, technical people, uh, et cetera, who own, own these lowriders. They came in into the playground, I did my presentation, and then they uh, answered questions and dialogued with the audience. And the, there were whole families, kids, wives, uh, husbands, brothers, uncles, aunts, you name it. So, this is very much a family activity. And I just, uh, I'm going to run through these fairly fast so you can see the intricacy. Now, one of the things that happens is that mirrors are put under the car so that people can see uh, the underneath. Um, because every feature of this car is, you know, when the, judging, the judges come around, they look at the interiors, at the upholstery, they look at the uh, embellishments, they look at the murals that are on the, on the sides of cars, the trunks, the insides of trunks, the insides of, uh, of hoods. They look at the wheels. They look at the hydraulic systems. They look at the motors, et cetera. And all of this is judged. And then um, a, uh, uh, several winners are, are, are announced at the end of the lowrider uh, show, usually on a Saturday afternoon. This is an idea of the lowrider or the hydraulic system with multiple batteries and hydraulics that are, that's housed in the, in the, uh, in the trunk of the car. This is, uh, cars come from throughout the southwest of these large super shows. For example, at the show in Las Vegas, there was a, uh, probably several lowrider uh, clubs from New Mexico represented. So typically what people do is they put them in tra covered trailers and then they take, uh, bring the, uh, the low riders to the shows and they push them into the uh, uh, to the uh, to the halls because they're not meant to be driven. In fact, you'll never find a car this elaborate on the street, as there's just too much uh, energy and uh, money invested in them. Another Mexican revolutionary theme: a 
uh, revolutionary soldier uh, with the bandoliers uh, crossed across his chest. Uh, just scenes depicting who knows what, just whatever the, the whim of the particular owner is. Um, not only do you have lowrider cars, but you have lowrider motorcycles. Now these are elaborate, uh, elaborate vehicles, just to give you an idea. Now, this starts early. The kids can't afford to buy their own car, they can't afford to buy their own motorcycle, so they work on, motor on, on bicycles, so they're uh, lowrider bicycles. As you can see here, there's a lot of work, a lot of pride, a lot of artistry, and a lot of mechanical know-how that goes into producing one of these vehicles uh, to show. Tri a tricycle. So it's a family. It's multi-generational. With a mirror, nonetheless. You know. There's another one. And typically, at any super show, you'll see the full gamut. You'll see the uh, uh, cars uh, in one section that are competing for, for money. You'll see the, uh, uh, the motorcycles in another section. You'll see the bicycles, tricycles, and even a lowrider car. Although this doesn't, this is, hasn't been uh, modified very much. Just uh, a mural on, this, on the, uh, the hood of a car just to give you a sense of uh, of, of the, the kinds of uh, murals and decorations that are put on cars. Now this probably represents a year's work. You know, the, paint, the, uh, multi, uh, the painting on a multi, uh, multiple layers and then the, uh, the decals that are put on after uh, uh, the paint and the finish is, is done. This one won a prize, I think, for its, uh, its, uh, it, the paint and the decals, as you see here in the trophy in the front. All kinds of, uh, here, here's a Volkswagen, even Volkswagens count. Um, a trend that's, uh, uh, that began probably maybe 10 years ago is, is to use uh, foreign cars. So you see a lot of Toyotas, you see a lot of Hondas, you see BMWs, you see uh, uh, Volkswagens, etc. Just give you an idea here. And this is, gives you an idea of the interior the amount of work that goes on in, in tearing out the old, old upholstery and putting in uh, uh, brand new upholstery that has uh, some artistic um, elements to it as well. Here's the interior of another car that's really, really plush. And again, these are for display. They're really not to be driven on the streets. Um, you can get an idea of how much uh, work and how much dedication goes into the creation of these cars. Um, some are Christian car clubs, and they proudly display their uh, the Christian icons and their identities on, on the cars and on the banners that accompany the, the, car, the car clubs. And, and you have uh, biblical quotations here uh, that, are, that are part of the, uh, of the banner. This one, sophisticated few group from Arizona. Now. At the super shows, and this is from the Los Angeles uh, show, at one point during the afternoon, uh, you're called to go out uh, to a display area on the outside of the, uh, of, the, of the exhibit hall, and this is where the contests take place. Now, these are not lowriders that have decorative elements that are expensive in that sense, but what these cars specialize in is powerful hydraulic systems. <laughs> So they compete, They're, they go from a, uh, a, a position uh, flat on the, on the asphalt here, and then uh, at a designated signal, the, uh, the owner stands outside of the car, the owner is not in the car, but manipulates the car from the outside to get the car to rise to as far as it can in height without falling over. And we saw some actually fall over. So, this is another competition with a different kind of car that emphasizes the mechanics, the hydraulics. Here you have another, another competition. And then you have what the, uh, the dance competition. So the person stands out and dances the car on its four wheels uh, according to a designated pattern. And here's one, <laughs> off its, completely off of its, off the asphalt on, um, yeah, I was lucky to get this shot. Actually, I think it was my wife who shot this one. 
Good. Great. So the point is that lowriders as cultural icons have evolved from uh, something that started um, out, out as a sort of post-Second World War uh, cultural phenomenon in the Los Angeles area, then evolved uh, with the introduction of hydraulics uh, and spread throughout the Southwest. And I have to say, you can find lowrider clubs now in Detroit, New York, Atlanta, you name it, all over the United States. And of course, with the number of uh, US soldiers in Japan, Japan has a very active lowrider uh, community. It's got its own magazine, it's got its own shows. Germany has, uh, where US troops have been stationed for since the Second World War, has its own lowrider community, et cetera. So uh, that's it in a nutshell.